Today will be a day to remember for the rest of your life. The Pro Football Hall of Fame is excited to present the heart of a Hall of Famer program connected by Extreme Networks. With over 100 Hall of Famers participating, we have reached 47 states and countries all over the world sharing the message that football is more than a game and can teach Americans important life values like commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and honesty. When you have to make right decisions, even when nobody's watching you. Well, respect is not just given out. It's not handed out like a, like a, like a brochure. It's earned. Today, you are presented with an opportunity to meet and learn from one of the greatest football players of all time. But more important than that, the chance to see that their Hall of Fame life wasn't given to them. They didn't roll out the bed great. They put the work in, on the field, in the weight room, in the classroom, in their communities. They made themselves a Hall of Famer on and off the field. Your feet can't take you where your mind's never been. Because you can make it, but it's just going to take a little hard work, and some effort, and the drive and determination. And today, you will learn you can do the same thing they did. You don't have to have a gold jacket or a bronze bust to make a difference in the lives of others. It's your decision whether you want to be a successful student, son, daughter, brother, or sister. If attitudes are contagious, is your attitude worth catching? It's integrity as well, because when you decide to pursue something and you don't quit, that says a lot about you. Commitment to excellence. We can all aspire to be the best. Welcome to a once-in-a-lifetime program, the heart of a Hall of Famer program connected by Extreme Networks. The head coach told me that I was not going to start. They had decided to go with the younger ball players, the ones I had mentored that whole summer. This not described me. I fell out of love with football for the first time in my life. This not sent me and my son Trey back to Whistler, Alabama, where my family, my community, and my church welcomed me home. Back in August, when the phone call came from Dave Baker, the senior Hall of Fame committed, and a few Hall of Famers, I began to hope and pray that football might be ready to love me back. So, Mr. Hall of Famer Kenny Houston, Earl Campbell, Evan Bethea, Curly Cup, Mike Check, Jackie Slater, Lim Bunny, Juan Moon, Ricky Jackson, my man, Lawrence Taylor, and my class of 2018 Pro Football Hall of Fame. When they knocked on my door, all of my dreams came true. And after all these years, I'm at home. All right, with that, I'd like to welcome everybody here to the Pro Football Hall of Fame for another installment of the Pro Football Hall of Fame's part of a Hall of Famer series connected by Extreme Networks. Uh, my name is Jake Ray. I'm the Youth and Education Manager here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and I'll be moderating the session today, get the awesome opportunity to sit up here with one of the greatest to ever play the game. Our mission here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame is to honor the greatest of the game, preserve its history, promote its values, and to celebrate excellence together. We're excited to hear how those values we promote, those of commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and honesty, not only made this guy who's going to be sitting in this chair a Hall of Famer, but it made him a great man, a great member of his community, and truly is one of the reasons he's sitting here today. So I'm excited to hear how those values impacted his life on and off the field. Uh, before we bring out our special guest today, I do have some thank yous I'd like to send, uh, pass out. First and foremost, I'd like to thank our great partners at Extreme Networks for providing us here at the Hall of Fame this opportunity 
today and all of the students we have here in the building today. Uh, without you guys, this, this program doesn't take, without the, their help, this program doesn't take place. Do a lot of great work for people uh, here uh, at the Hall of Fame and then as well as all over the country, uh, schools all over there. So thank you so much uh, for all your help and support. And secondly, teachers, administrators, educators, principals, anybody that either brought their students here to Canton, Ohio today or are watching us live on YouTube right now, thank you so much for allowing us just to be a small part students learning experience. And then lastly, I have to thank our students. You know, without you guys here, uh, this program doesn't take place without you. It's just me sitting up here having a conversation in an empty room. So we're super excited to have you guys today. It's not very often that you guys get the opportunity to have a Hall of Famer in front of you talking about their football career. More importantly, what helped them become the best person they can be. Uh, we have some students in the back uh, who, uh, who were picked. They have a, a question card with them. Uh, we're going to be going to them periodically throughout the program today to ask questions. If you don't have a card and you have a question that you think is a pretty good one, find Jerry in the orange polo in the back. Uh, tell him what your question is. And then if we can get it in the program, we can. Uh, if you're watching us live on YouTube, you also have the question uh, opportunity to ask questions today. Uh, if you have a question and you're watching us live, go ahead and put that in the comment section in the live chat, and we'll do our best to make it a part of a program as well. No matter where you're watching us from here today, though, we know you're going to be taking some pictures, taking some videos. So if you post anything on social media, make sure you use the tag at ProFootballHOF and tag at Extreme Networks and use the hashtag HOF values. And our social team will be on the lookout for that stuff today. So today, I am super proud and humbled to welcome a 10-season NFL vet who played in 147 games. He was a member of the 1970s All-Decade Team, five-time All-Pro, seven-time Pro Bowler, and most importantly, a Hall of Famer, Mr. Robert Brazil. How you doing, sir? How you doing today? Good morning. What you say? Thanks, Jake. Wow. Jake, thanks for that great introduction. Thank you. Oh. So first and foremost, I'd like to welcome you back here to your second home in Canton, Ohio. We always enjoy having you back. Um, always like to start out and, and talk a little bit about what it means coming back to Canton. You know, obviously you've, you've walked through this building as Robert Brazil NFL legend. And then after your enshrinement, you came back to the building as Robert Brazil Hall of Famer. Was there a difference? And, and what did you feel coming back labeled a Hall of Famer? Let's just go back a little further, Jake. You know, the wait to get here. You guys don't know what it feels like to want something really, really bad to work for it every day of your life majority of your life. I ain't got to be 70 now, so some of that's the past of my work. To finally get that that knock that everybody's been waiting for, that telephone call, it's an unusual feeling. I mean, you have to be in these uh, Adidas to feel what I feel. I have to have the heart that has had a quadruple bypass, two hip replacements, to feel what I feel when they say you are a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It's the ultimate feeling. First of all, they give you three things. They give you a ring. They give you a gold jacket. And over in that building is a bus. Right there. That he right oh, there. Hey, there you are, right there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and the most important thing they give you is a number. I'm Hall of Famer 312. There will never be another Hall of Famer with the number 312. That they can take, I can die. When I die, I still be Hall of Famer 312. And that feeling that you get when they when they label you that or you accomplish that, guys, I want all of y'all to feel that once in your life. It's unbelievable, Jake. Awesome. We are we are super excited. You are Hall of Famer 312, a part of our family here in Canton, Ohio. Um, I mentioned at the beginning those values uh, we believe in here at the Hall of Fame, commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and honesty. How have those values played a part in your life, both on and off the field? And is there one that sticks out that was more important in, in your career journey? Well, you know, Jake, uh, the one that sticks out, you know, when I was uh, a kid, uh, y'all age and younger, you know, my parents, my uncles, my teachers, my friends always would point out when I was headed in the wrong direction. 
But a point in their life, they expected me to do the right thing when one when nobody else was watching. In my household, we call that integrity. It's doing the right thing when no one is watching. It takes courage and respect to do that. But integrity will bring honesty and respect from others. And that's what will make you a better person. Awesome. And you know, so how are you able to take those lessons you learned in your home growing up as a kid and then apply them to your football career? You know, because the, you know, it, it's so interesting that you can take these values you learned throughout your entire life and then apply them to the game of football. How did how did that help you become an eventual Hall of Famer? Let's say not only the game of football, let's say the game of life. I mean, in your classroom, you know, my dad, I'm the oldest of three boys and the smallest. I got a brother, a hamburger away from 400 and two of them <laughs> another, a, a double meat from another 350, but I'm the smallest. My mom expected me to do the right thing and show them the right path to, to leave an, ex, an example for those guys. And when I got a chance to leave the house and go out on the football field, I took that same leadership role. I wanted to be the best. I didn't want nobody to outdo me. I wanted to outwork. You know, I, I always think about this guy that all y'all know about. Y'all ever heard of Walter Payton? I had the opportunity to sneak with Walter Payton for years, four years at Jackson State. And I thought I worked it hard. Walter would work, outwork me. I'd get up at 10 o'clock at night and sneak out the, out the dorm and work out. But that's the type of attitude me and him had to outwork each other. But it made us what we are today, Hall of Famers. What, what was it like, you know, and you mentioned Walter Perry, what was it truly like to, to see that work ethic and to see his success in college and then his success in the NFL? Now your teammates again with him here uh, in Canton at the Hall of Fame. What was it like to see him that? And then how did you take the experience from your time in college at an HBCU and use that in your NFL career? Well, uh, nowadays, you know, you got the thing called internet. <laughs> and uh, I heard it's pretty big. It's pretty big now. And uh cell phone, I just probably would have never been discovered if we hadn't had a Walter Payton. Walter bought all the scouts to Jackson State. When they got there, they found out, wow, there's a guy named Jackie Slater could play. There's a guy named Leon Gray could play. There's a guy named, who's that guy right there keep hitting Walter? What's his name? That's Rob Brazil. So that spotlight shined on me. So he was my internet. He the one that bought the scouts <laughs> there to give me a shot. I owe a lot of my this gold jacket to Walter because if he hadn't been like he was going to Kansas, I probably would never been discovered. You know, so I give all that credit to Walter. Jake. I mean, looking back on your time at HBCU, what was one of the things you took away? Obviously, we're in February, Black History Month. We've seen how much more prevalent, you know, whether it's you know, credit to Dion being at Jackson State, and we've seen HBCUs take off in popularity. You know, there, we do a huge career fair or college fair here during the Black College Football Hall of Fame induction weekend where we have 30 mm -hmm. some HBCUs here. Why, what did you take away and why was it so important for you to attend an HBCU? Well, can I tell the story how I got there first? Sure, go ahead. Okay, when I was in high school my senior year, I was a sought out for big blue chipper. I was supposed to go to offers with Auburn, Alabama, LSU, Mississippi State, anybody in the SAC had offered me a scholarship. But in my senior year, I broke this arm. And on the opening kickoff, Jake, and the scouts literally got up out of this stadium and walked out. All of my, all my dreams did like this. Troy State, which was a college in Alabama, offered me a letter of intent. Now, guys, y'all got to understand, this is back in the late 60s, early 70s. My mother had never seen a two-piece swimsuit. She's a mother of the church. My dad is a deacon. We drive up on Troy State campus during the springtime, and every young lady out there, guy, I was laid like this. My mama looked at my dad and said, you got to turn the car around, Robert. He can't go to school here. So here it is. Four weeks out from going to Jackson, I'm going to a, a, a university at Troy. My, she said, you got to find another school. So the next weekend, we go to Jackson State. 
I had a cousin that played there, introduced me to the head coach. Bob Hill came out, never looked at me. I had a friend named Ricky Young who played with the Minnesota Vikings and the San Diego Chargers. Bob Hills looked at Rick and said, mm, can you block, son? He said, yes, sir. He said, can you catch? He said, yes, sir. He said, I give you a scholarship. I need somebody to block for Walter. The first time in my life I had heard the name Walter Payton. I said, coach, what about me? And this is the first time that I've ever been told this in football. Somebody told me I had to make their team. Everybody wanted me on their team. And I'm saying, I got to make your team. He said, you can try as a, as a try. And Jake, I was a walk on to Jackson, but I walked on to this for him, gentlemen. It's gold jacket. <laughs> All right. That's how that's how my career went. I say it worked out pretty well. I, I think so. say I think so. I think so. Uh want to ask some questions now to our student audience. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and step up to the microphone. Go ahead and state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. Uh my name is Dakota. I'm from McKinley. And my question is, how did you take the lessons you learned from playing football and apply them to your own life? Lessons you learned from the game. How'd you, we've talked about how you've taken the lessons you from your life and apply them to the game. Vice versa. How did you take the lessons you learned from playing football to become a, the best member of your community family that you could be? Good question. Great question. How many of you got up with a good attitude and with a bad attitude this morning? Good character and bad character this morning. I got up every day with good character trying to outwork everybody. My attitude was outworking and trying to be the best is what you get up with, what you work with, what you carry around with you every day is what's gonna make you a better person at the end of that day, okay? If you get up and talk about I'm gonna do, the, I ain't gonna do nothing today. <laughs> what you accomplish, nothing. But if you get up with the attitude that you wanna do something and be somebody, you can take it wherever you wanna go with it. Awesome. All right. We're going to take our next question. So go ahead, next student, go ahead and step up, state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question here for Mr. Brazil. I'm Shania. I go to Mergonia. When adversity struck, where did you go to regain your confidence? So when adversity struck, those tough times that everybody's got to go through, who did you look to? Where did you go to to regain that confidence to get you back where you needed to be? When adversity First of all, I had, I had got a lot of faith in, in my Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to him first and ask him to lead me in the right way. I know it's good choices out there and it's bad choices that all of us is facing every day, guys. But the one thing you got to be doing when you're making those choices, you got to be tolerant with the person or the obstacle that you're facing. You're not right and that person not wrong that's bringing this problem or that adversity to you. Just be tolerant. Sometimes just listen and be patient and it'll work its way out. Don't make no harsh, quick decisions and nothing that you do. That's a pretty good answer, I think. Uh, all right, we're gonna go to an, another student in the back there. So go ahead and step up, state your name. Uh, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. I think we got a little, uh, little Oilers representation here today in the back. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Abigail. Uh, I go to Mordonia as well. Uh, who influenced you the most in your life, and how or why did that person do it? The person that influenced me mm -hmm. the most? My name is Robert Lorenzo Brazil Jr. My dad is a senior, and he's the one that I got up every morning before day to see him go to work. And he would wake me up at two or three o'clock in the morning because he worked two jobs. I never saw this guy as long as I've been on this earth for 70 years, missed a day of work, was out sick from work. And he gave me my work ethics and he gave me something to shoot at to outdo him. And one of the most precious things I've done was to let him to present me in the Pro Football for Hall of Fame because, because of him, I'm sitting here today. And he's living now. He's 90 years old and still driving the Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talk about you, you know, having him present you at the Hall of Fame. You know, we got the big picture up here yeah. from after your speech. Um, what I always like to, to look, get the insight to, what's the like five seconds after your speech is done? The, the bus has been unveiled, the jacket's on, 
your weekend is pretty much complete at that point. So you finish your speech. What's that moment like? Is there a relief? Are you excited, happy, sad? What's that feeling like when you, you have finally completed that, that enshrinement week? Life changing. Life changing. You're finally here. You're finally a member of the Hall of Fame. And you can take a deep breath because you, you don't know how good your speech is going to go off. There's somebody there that, that you wanted to be there. I forgot the name of my two granddaughters. And I was like, oh my God, they're gonna kill me. <laughs> but it's, it's such a relief, but it's also such an honor to be here with the best, the, the best of the game. I mean, the greatness and the people that's, I made a promise if I got here, and I'm telling you now, I will not miss any scrimmage that I'm here to become because it was so important to see all of these Hall of Famers saying, welcome, you finally, you heard the speech say, I'm at home, I am, I'm at home. So you, you go through the, uh, your enshrinement week, you know, busy, you're doing stuff every day, but then you come back for another one. What's that like when there's, you know, you're just here to, to, to help everybody else out? What's that, what's that uh, experience like? First of all, you're praying that that guy that's up there speaking ain't going to speak for seven minutes like he's supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> because there's so much going on, guys. And I say that everybody has a party or something they're going to do during that week. And you got so many things you have to do while we're here. And we want to enjoy all of it. But once you get that pressure off of you and you can relax and be a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, it's more relaxing. It's just, you know, just like when you graduate, say, oh, no more, no more tests today. I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> I got some more questions here in the back. So go ahead and state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. Uh, I'm Isaac. I go to Oberlin. Uh, what is your favorite moment in your NFL career and why? What is my favorite moment? Yes, sir. Okay. I never thought I was going to be a first rounder. All right. That was one of my favorite moments. I played 10 years without missing a game, not missing a start. That's another favorite moment. I walked away from the game. That was another favorite moment. And then inducted into the pro football was my favorite moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you talk a little bit, and we heard a little bit there in that video, that speech. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, when you did walk away from the game, you know, your speech references where, you know, there was a younger player that was coming up that you yeah, had mentored, yeah. and it was time for that transition to happen. Yes. What were some of the things you learned from that um, happening in your career? It's the adversity of getting over things. You know, um, first of all, it happened that hit in Canton. A lot of people don't know. The Houston Oilers was playing the New York Giants in the Hall of Fame game. There's two linebackers that supposed to have been the best two linebackers in the NFL was playing in that game. And when they are both friends, Lawrence Taylor and Robert Brazil, we are both like, okay, we're going to show everybody what we're going to do today. So two hours before the game, Coach, I want to see you, Robert. So I go in the office and Coach says, Robert, we're not going to let you start. So I got to be the best of the best. And I got to hold all this feeling, all this anxiety, all this thing on the inside of me. You're not going to let me start? Hmm. I go, okay. I was a gentleman. I said, right now I'm officially retired. And that was the first time in my life, guys, when I say this, I get the same feeling that I fell out of love with football because I wanted this Hall of Fame so bad. Me and Lawrence was going to turn this game out. We was going to break all the rules and regulations to see who was going to get the most sack, the most <laughs> this, because I was Lawrence Idol, and I, I was a fan of his. He took my game to another level, another level. And it meant so much, but fell out. I was just destroyed. So I went to my coach and told him, I'm not going to play. I'm going to retire right here at the Hall of Fame where I deserve to be. So I never watched football for a while. It took years and years for me to sit down and watch NFL football. I would watch college and high school football. I came went home and became a high school coach. 
One day I was over to my mom's, like I'd go every Sunday after church and visit her. And she was sitting watching TV and I was going out the door. She said, babe, why don't you sit down and watch TV with me? It's the guy here who got your jersey on, number 52. He can play too. He bought better than you. I said, who? Like that. <laughs> so she made me sit down. And that person was Ray Lewis. As soon as I sit down, Ray Lewis made the tackle. Ray Lewis farmer made a made a made a force of farmer. And he got intercepted in the same game. So I became a Ray Lewis fan, not knowing some years later, guys, that Ray Lewis and Robert Brazil would be enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame the same day. That's how I grew that's how I grew up my mama in football. She can pick a Hall of Fame. I'm in the back of it. <laughs> Uh, and it's cool you mentioned that, that and I think there is, you know, talking about your relationship with Lawrence Taylor, there is such a high level of respect between the game's greatest, not only when they're playing, but here inside the Hall of Fame as so well. True. Talk a little bit about, you know, when you get back to Canton, see everybody, how high of a level of respect is there when all of the Hall of Famers are around each other? This is probably the only city in America that you could do that, you know. When you that gold jacket, we I don't know where y'all, what high school y'all are from. Um, we I know I've seen some of these faces along the parade route. To be here to share a hotel room or to share a week with some of the greatest, with some of your idols, we get more autograph amongst each other than y'all do. <laughs> <laughs> because we are when you become a student of the game and a Hall of Fame of the game, you respect that person. You know what it takes for him to get here. And there's a lot of Hall of Fame that deserving to be here. And we can't wait to get them here to get the same feeling, man. All right. We're going to go ahead to the back for another question. So go ahead and state your name, the school you go to. Don't be embarrassed. And then go ahead and ask your question. My name is Zari, and I go to Nardonia High School. What types of adversities did you face as an African-American in the South during the 1960s and 70s? What type of adversities I faced? Yes. All right. Y'all don't know nothing about this also. I was one of the uh, first people to be bused to a all predominant white school in Mobile, Alabama. I'm gonna say that again. I was one of the first blacks to be bused from a black school to a white school. My high school only had five blacks in it, a, a high school of 3,000. I was called everything but Robert Brazil Jr. I was treated like everybody but Robert Brazil Jr. But the adversity that I had to go through made me a better person because I had to show them who I was and what I was about. I went there and took a starting position. I made my, my, uh, my great average with all A's and I was fast, smart, and good looking. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, did I ask your question? <laughs> Um, you know, you obviously there's you, you went through so much growing up as a kid. Um, did that, you know, you mentioned injury kind of caused you to to throw those bigger schools to step away. But w was it was there a part of you that that did want to attend an HBCU? Did go to Jackson State uh, just because of the culture that was there? No, I always liked it. Uh, I didn't know nothing about Jackson too much, but I always wanted to go to an HBCU. But when you sitting there with a stack of letters from the SEC and they promising you this, you know, I'm gonna buy you a new new Corvette, uh, you know. I mean, uh, they didn't do that. They didn't do that out loud, right? No, no, no. But I'm telling y'all, they did this. You know, you know, uh, my dad working at the shipyard, he finally, you know, he go from, from here to this paying job and saying, "But we need your son to go to this school." And I said, "No, Dad, I'm, you know, do what I have to do, but and just do it right." But it was a challenge for me. But I think for me to go through an HBCU, if I had to do it all over, I'd do it again. I'd do it all again. I had three sons, two went to HBC. One was, I have four white kids, guys. So I'm gonna get upset when I have to say this. And I got four, uh, three, three black kids. I had some kids, my wife had some kids. We put the Brady Bunch together. And they all have a master or a doctor at my house. So that's what I'm awesome. supposed to do in my house. Cool. All right, we'll take another question from the back of the room here. So go ahead again, state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I'm Brooklyn. I'm from Nadonia. Uh, why is Black History Month important for our country to return? 
Why is Black History Month? You know, I'm gonna say this and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I think every culture should have their month, not only Black. We focus on one month for Black folk. I think other cultures like should have their month also. You know, I, I'm a great believer in that fair, and fair is fair. You know, we just say, how many other people are like, do the Chinese have a Chinese month? Do the Hawaiians have a, a Hawaiian month? Do the Italians have a Italian month? That's pretty fair if we're gonna do it. But I'm grateful that we do it. We do it. You know, everybody, what about the poor Indians, man? They the ones started in the United States. And they don't even have a month. And I'm not saying that I'm wrong or right, but this is how I feel, Robert Brazil feel, that we share things that we don't not share with the things that we share uh, everywhere. We're gonna go ahead and take another student here, another question from the, our students in the back. So go ahead and step up, state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead with your question. Hello. My Hello. Name is <laughs> I come from McKinley. Besides being selected for the Hall of Fame, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment and why? Greatest accomplishment in your life besides having that, that nice fancy jacket on. First of all, you say you're from Chile? Yes. What part? McKinley, McKinley. I thought she said Chile. I thought she said Chile. I, yeah. said I got a, uh, a son-in-law from Chile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the question? Uh, outside of being a Hall of Famer, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment? A father. You know, I worked in the school system for 25 years. And when I uh, was asked after my, my retirement from pro football, I had did everything in America that a young man could do. But the most important thing that I hadn't done was to be, be an all pro, an all world daddy. I went home in the system to be a daddy, not only to my own kids, but other kids in Mobile that needed that person they could count on and talk to. That 25 years I worked in special ed and gifted kids area because I want them to be able to have a fair shot in life like I had. All right, we're gonna go to another question. Speaking of that, we're gonna have our student go ahead and step up to the microphone here, uh, state their name the school they could go to and then go ahead and ask their question. And I think this might go along with what we were just talking about right there. My name is Logan and I go to Richmond Heights schools. For a period in your retirement, you were a middle school teacher for students with special needs. What did that experience teach you? Wow, no sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, at the time I had met my wife, which is named, her name is Brenda. And these kids, I would take home every day. It was just me and my son. My first wife was killed in a car accident out in Houston that same year that I retired from the Orleans. Uh, these kids meant so much to me. Uh, to be able to answer that question, be, to be able to be their mouth, to be their, 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 their safe haven. I had a Victoria home in Mobile, Alabama. And I think at one time we had 30 kids spending the night with us. It was just me and my son. And it, it was so rewarding, man. It was just like, I didn't, I didn't want them to pay me to, to teach at that school. I just wanted to work there. We've talked a little bit here today about your career, obviously, and you played your entire career with the Houston Oilers. Obviously, we know the Houston Oilers are not around here today, but they've become the, the Tennessee Titans. And we've talked about this before, but how cool is it for the Titans organization now to embrace people, our, our former stars, Hall of Famers like you, who played for the Oilers, but didn't play for the actual Titans organization? How cool is it to go back to Nashville and be celebrated by the Titans organization? You know, uh, during that time, I never, that time where that I wasn't watching football and during that time, I never had a homecoming. The Houston Oilers didn't exist no more. They had moved out of Houston over to Tennessee. So all the people around the NFL would have homecoming weekend and this and there, all the teammates would get together. When Amy Adams struck, which is the owner of the Tennessee Titans, I saw her grow up. I knew uh, her dad hired me as a linebacker. She was a little girl that ran, ran, you know, ran around with the horses and all this. She reached out to me and asked about that. And I said, Amy, all I want to do is get a chance 
to see the old love you blue guy. I want to become a Tennessee Titan. I want a homecoming. I want to go back and enjoy the things that we should enjoy and be because the Tennessee Titans, and they end up putting me in the ring of honor there. And you're talking about an honor of, to be able to be a, 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 a born a Houston all, but I'm gonna die a Tennessee Titan because of that ring of honor that they put me in up there. So it's a great accomplishment. Now, obviously you see with the Titans in a two-tone blue, but how awesome is it to, to see those Oilers jersey, that, that, that Oiler blue pop up, we had the hat already. How cool is it to see that powder blue every once in a while? That's probably the prettiest jersey in the NFL. That jersey, not that not, one. I would say that one looks a little rough. That's ugly. But that love you blue, <laughs> that love you blue jersey, it's one of the prettiest jerseys that you ever seen. I wish I had one to show y'all, but um, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take another question from the back here. Uh, go ahead and state your name, the school you go to, uh, and then go ahead with your question. My name's Sean. I go to McKinley High School. What was one of the moments in your life when your character was tested? How did you get through that? So when your character, a moment when your character was tested, a tough time. We talked a little bit about adversity already, but one time when you had to really look at yourself in the mirror, and how did you get through that? Um, after I retired, you know, everybody was talking about this one play. <clears throat> We're in the NFC championship game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I would call the back, drop back, throw a fade, fade route to Mike Renfro in the end zone. He tapped her, touched there. The referee hollered up. They broke the holler and said, the play was called no good. Now, everybody that was, had them, them pretty jerseys on, them lovely blue jerseys, was over there hollering, screaming, fussing at the referee. We still had two more quarters to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I'm over there, hey, y'all, come on, come on, let's get, forget about that play. And I, you know, that was one of the moments that I still hurts me today. I could not gather my team being one of the leaders back and being get back focused on the game. They were so worried about that one call, Jay. And that, that one call led to what y'all see today is instant replay. But we did not, I could not get my team back together. So that, that haunts me that being the leader of that team that I couldn't get them back together. How important is it to, you know, in, in, in that moment, you know, you were the one that stepped up kind of as that vocal leader. But even if you're, you're not comfortable with that, how important is it for students players in the league, whatever you might be, to embrace some sort of leadership role in their friend group, in the classroom, at home. What, what can that teach you as an individual? You got to get up out the bed in the morning. You know, how many made their bed up this morning? God, what the hell, what, what were y'all doing? Y'all didn't make your bed up this morning? <laughs> That's that leadership role that mama gave you every day. You should get up and do something for yourself. And that, that's a small thing that you need that leadership on, in, the, in the classroom, down the hall where the teacher's at. You need somebody to step up because somebody's going to do something that we're not going to make it be so proud of. If we get more people to step up, step up and speak out and bring attention to that person that's trying to corrupt or mislead or talk about or mishandle something, this world would be a better place, Jake. I mean, it would, you know, but I didn't have no help. Everybody else, I thought I was off that day. Yeah. All <laughs> so right, I'm we're going to y'all to be better than that. <laughs> we're going to another question in the back here. So go ahead and state your name. Hi, the school you go to. Well, hold on. The school you go to. And then go ahead and ask your question. He's just ready to ask that question. My name is Christian Tuss. I'm from Richmond Heights. What was your welcome to the NFL moment? Welcome to the NFL. When did you realize that you were at the big time, the big level now? It started at the senior bowl, son. You know, uh, I got an, an invite to, in my hometown to play in the senior bowl game. And if you go to the senior bowl, that is the, the gateway to the NFL. They say that, that's when you go to that, you're going to get drafted. I was born and raised in Mobile. My dad was a bartender during that time. And he bartended the senior bowl. He said, oh, you want to go to senior I said, dad, I want to play in it. I want to play in it. When I got that invite, I knew I was going to get a shot in the NFL. And all I wanted for, for them to open the door, and I was going to close it after me, and the line was going to start back there. <laughs> Wait, was there a moment, you, we talked at the beginning, you know, about, you know, that moment uh, when you're playing against Lawrence Taylor, obviously, I'm, you know, not a lineup across from each other, but was there a moment 
maybe a Hall of Famer that your teammates with now that lined up across from you on offense that when you had to step back and realize it's like, all right, this guy's good. Was there, was there a player uh, that you saw? Obviously, could, you got to practice in college with a lot of great guys. Well, but. I could name Anthony Muzo, <laughs> Art Shell, <laughs> all these left tackles, man. You had to bring your A game. You knew that you had to close the show. In other words, they was going to block you, but you had to close the show. That means you got to, you got to outplay them somewhere down the line to get the last lick in or to make them, force them to make a mistake. Because you didn't know that they was going to be Hall of Famers. But when you go up against the Hall of Fame, you're going to, you know, I've been blocked. I've been, you know, knocked on my butt. I've been, you know, everything that happened to me that I did to somebody else. <laughs> but most of the people that does that, they got to go jack. <laughs> All right, got another question here in the back. Go ahead and state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead with your question. Uh, my name is Drew. I go to Oberlin. My question is, is there a player in the game today that you think reminds you of the way you played? I'm much bigger than these guys just playing, you know. <laughs> uh, but the attitude that guy from Dallas, that was a perky. Micah Parsons. The boy can play. He jump your dog. He jump your dog. He can play, and he's close to me and Lawrence, but he ain't, he stepped up. He got a couple more years to grow. <laughs> uh, what excites you about watching? You know, obviously, you know, you mentioned you flip your TV on. Ray Lewis is on there. You flip it on nowadays. What excites you the most about the NFL that you see uh, played now? What I do, you know, uh, see, I got a problem with Patrick Mahomes. They let him run around too much. <laughs> See, Patrick wouldn't have that if I was playing. Two seconds, he want to know where Robert Brazil at. He going to have three seconds to throw a judge. I'm, I'm going to be his worst nightmare. He's not going to sleep that night because <laughs> I'm going to find out what hotel is and go knock on the door. I'm out here waiting. You come to the to game tomorrow. <laughs> uh, you know, you mentioned, obviously, Patrick Mahomes, obviously, the Super Bowl just happened. Um, any thoughts on, on the game? You know, one of the greatest, you know, one of the best played Super Bowls we've seen in a long time. What was, what were your thoughts after seeing that game and, and you know, the outcome at the end? A well-played game, but the NFL has gotten to one or two mistakes and you're out of the game. There was two mistakes that Philadelphia made. They lost the game. Just two, you know, the fumble from Jalen. And, you know, that's what the NFL, that's what they call it, not for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, you know, at the Super Bowl, obviously the Hall of Fame had a presence down there, announced our brand new class of 2023 with the names like Rondé Barber, Joe Thomas, Joe Klecko, some of the best, obviously, to ever play the game that are going to be enshrined here in Canton. If you could give them one piece of advice as they go through this whole thing, as they come here for their visit, as they come back in August to do it, get their, their jacket, give their speech, what is one piece of advice you would want them to know? You know that um, Saturday before the game, the pro football presents you, your wife, and you with a playbook. And if you follow that playbook and fulfill every step of that playbook, you will be prepared for the enshrinement. I thought I had lost my wife. My wife is a chemistry teacher, but she turned into a pro football Hall of Fame of wife. And I thought I was going to go crazy before the Hall of Fame. You got to do this. You got to do this. You can't do that. You That's, that's moving too fast. Stick to the playbook that y'all give them. And they'll be prepared for August the 1st or August the 2nd when the day is gone. As a, as a current Hall of Famer, what excites you about this new class coming in? Are, are you excited to see them get the can? Excited to see them yes, get I'm, their bus, their jackets and everything? I'm so excited. And I wish that Kim Riley will be here. The guy was so deserving to be here, man. But his family will be able to share that. But to know somebody and to play against somebody and see them not get the, like when I go to talking about the Hall of Fame, oh, um, chill, bones, and all that goes through me because it's such a great feeling, man, for the person and his family. It's life changing. My mom and dad is 90, and they was at the Mardi Gras with. The love your blue jersey on. My son is pro football Hall of Fame on the back of it. You know, so that's the feeling. You know, at nine today, still enjoying it more than I am. And it's cool, you know, to see not only how much you enjoy it, but how much your family and friends enjoy the moment here yeah. in Canton as well. Yeah.
I got some more questions here in the back. Go ahead and state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. All right. Um, my name is Javon Lindsay. I go to Archbishop Obama High School. Uh, my question is, how proud are you of the fact that you attended an HBCU in Jackson State? How proud are you? I'm proud of your boss, too. <laughs> <laughs> a real man. That's an offensive tackle there, y'all. <laughs> I am so, hey, can you see my ring? Hmm? See that ring? Yeah. JSU. See that ring? Yep. Pro Football Hall of Fame. That's how proud I am. <laughs> we talked about it a little bit, but I want to focus on, obviously, Jackson State. Dion was there. Um, seen some videos of you getting to go down there, see practice, you know, talk to the team. How important was it for Dion to elevate not only Jackson State, but all of HB, HBCUs and then reach out to not only Hall of Famers, but Jackson State alumni like yourself to, you know, to we, come down and talk about that, how important it is. We have a close knit family at my house. And one morning before Dion, <coughs> excuse me, took the job, we're sitting there having breakfast, and what we call a brunch. We say brunch, that's fried fish, grits, biscuits, shrimp, and all that. It works. Sounds like a good breakfast. So my phone rang, and I look, I said, Deion Sanders. So I said, hello. He said, Hall of Famer 312, this is Dion. I said, what's up, dude? He said, uh, I need to ask you something. I said, anytime, Hall of Fame. You know, we, we brothers now. He said, I'm considering taking a job at Jackson State. I said, you know, I heard that. And uh, are you serious? It's real serious, serious, serious? He said, yes. And I want you to do one thing for me. I said, man, that's my alma mater. I'll do anything for you. If you need to help you or make a phone call for you. He said, no, all I want you to do is support me. And I said, before I can say anything, my 89-year-old mother said, Dion, don't worry about it. We got it. But right now, we finna eat breakfast. <laughs> My husband finna bless this food. Y'all talk later. <laughs> so I took my phone and went outside. I said, Dion, I'm going to go back in with my parents, but you got all my support, man. So the next week, when he accepted the job, I got in my car and I drove up there. He introduced me to the team. And I asked the team, I said, if anybody here do not want to be here, I didn't get an answer. I said, well, y'all turn around, dude. Now I turned around and looked at Dion. I said, there's one question that everybody's going to ask you. Why did you take the job at Jackson? And he looked at me. He said, God told me to come here. And that's so deep with me. I said, you got it, brother. Let's do it. And what he's done in the years from that, from that time we talked up until the day, I am so Proud of him. Back to back championship. All new facilities. Exposure, not only for Jackson State, for every HBCU. But he's also a dad. He's also a coach. He got a son, guys, that's. Woo! The boy gonna get the Heisman. To do his Heisman trophy material. But he's not going to get it at Jackson. He's not going to get it. Walter couldn't get it. McNabb couldn't get it. Jerry Rice couldn't get it. How's the dude going to get it? And Dion, people, let me tell y'all, don't stop praying for the guy. The guy is dealing with something that I don't know how long his health is going to hold up. His circulation in his legs, if you watch him, and the time he walk out on the field at the end of the game, he almost hopping or sitting on something. He may lose his legs, guys. That's how serious this is. So I'm worried about his health. And I'm also worried about his son that's deserving to get a Heisman Trophy. And I'm so proud of what he's done and what he's going to do in Colorado. Y'all better get in line. They're going to win. <laughs> if Deion touches, you, you're going to win. It's something about prime time. It means he's, gonna be, he's a winner. And he got the main person on his side. And that's who? Huh? Say it. Don't be shame. You got God with you. Awesome. I don't know how we follow that up. Uh, all right, go ahead. We got some more questions here in the back. Go ahead and state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead with your question. Uh, hi, I'm David. I go to Archbishop Pullman High School. What was it like playing for the Oilers during the Love You Blue movement? 
you know, you've mentioned the Love You Blue movement a little bit. Talk to us a little bit about what that meant to, to be a part of. You know, uh, I don't know. Y'all too young to have found the right person, but I know all y'all got the right family. You got somebody in that family that's always taking care of the rest of the family. Bon Phillip put together a group of guys that if I had to go put another NFL team together, i go back and pick those lovely blue guys. These guys were so special. But the only time, like I told you, I, I didn't, I couldn't do my part and nobody else to help me step up for that Pittsburgh game. But we still taught word and conversation with us that uh, kid, that's a good hat. Uh, if anything, we need the other one to step up. Amy, the owner of the Titan, one of the olives, Kenny Burroughs died. She flew in three different states to pick us up to take us to the funeral. That's how deep that is. I didn't love you, blue guy. Awesome. In All a I private got, jet. Nice. Very nice. All right, I got a couple more questions here in the back, and then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. So, again, go ahead and step up to the microphone there. Go ahead and state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead with your question. My name's Trey Rochelle. I go to East High School. Yeah. As a high school coach, what do you look for in a player? Desire and want. If you want to do something and you have the desire to do it, who can stop you? Good or bad? If you want to do something bad, you're going to do it. If you want to do something good, do it. And do it be the best at doing it. Great, I, that's uh, great. And we got, it uh, looks like we got one more here in the back and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. So go ahead and state your name. For, the, for me? For, for, the, for the audience. Oh, okay, all right, well after I, this I one. got the last question. After this one, all right. Go ahead and state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. My name's Solo Vaughn, and who was the greatest running back in Oiler or Titans history? Greatest running back in Oiler or Titans history? You got Derrick Henry, CJ2K. They can't take Walter George. Payton and Earl Campbell's shoes. Ooh. Earl Campbell going way back. Let's see. I'm going to tell y'all something now. How tough was it uh, to tackle him? I answered both of those questions. See, I had the pleasure of sleeping with both of them guys. Wait a minute. In a different bed. Something you never mind with the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Earl Camel, I slept on the road with the Houston Oilers. Walter Payton, I was his roommate at, at Jackson. And they was probably the two hardest running backs that I played against. Now, I got a chance to meet Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry's bigger than me. That's a big old target. I'm going to take that target out. <laughs> That's a whole buffet. I'm hungry when I get on the football field. <laughs> They still left. I did not sleep with them. Did you get that out your mind? <laughs> All right, we got one more in the back here. So go ahead and state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead with your question. Uh, my name is DK. I go to Nordonia High School. Where did the nickname Dr. Doom come from? Dr. Doom. Where did that person. nickname come from? Now, y'all better listen. Because after this, I'm going to ask you what that Doom stands for. D-O-O-M. Somebody need to figure that out. Okay, before y'all was born, you asked your granddaddies or you, you, some of your uncles and aunties, there used to be a game called the College All-Star Game. That's when the best of the College All-Star plays against the Super Bowl champion. In 1975, the College All-Star was played in Chicago, Illinois. This is before training camp and before the Hall of Fame game and all that. We was playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. It was a guy that played middle linebacker from SC named Richard Wood. <clears throat> His nickname was Batman. We had a couple more linebackers. One on the other side was called Crazy Man. Monkey Man on the other side and Rob Brazil. They all tried to figure out a nickname for me. So in the Chicago Tribune, it's a cartoon character named Dr. Doom. So, Richard, we were eating breakfast, and y'all don't know this guy either. His name is Howard Cosell, used to be a commentator. We eat breakfast, and Richard said, Brazil, I finally found you a nickname. 
It's a cartoon character. I said, no cartoon cat. <laughs> he says, Dr. Doom. I said, mm, that sounds pretty cool. That's, you know, like that. So Harvard Cosell stepped into our conversation and said, Richard, that name fits him. You take that Doom part and you break it down. I'm not going to tell you the answer because that's my question to you all. What does it mean? If anybody can figure out what the doom means, you'll know the answer for how I, I took that name and still be, still is called Dr. Doom. Do anybody know what doom means? I think you're going to have to tell them. Okay. We all know D. You got a question? Close. That's close. Very close. Come here, son. I signed it, and I'll send you my bill, 1850. <laughs> you know, it's very close. Richard, the finish the story, how say, you take that doom part, Richard, and you break it down, D-O-O-M. Their own offensive meaning, and that's why I took the name. That's cool, honey. <laughs> that's pretty cool. It's got a rhythm to it, and I like it. <laughs> and that's what I try to do every day, all day long. Um, so last question here for me, and then we're going to wrap up today. First and foremost, as we say at the beginning, thank you so much for, for coming here, taking time out of your schedule. Come back to your second home here uh, in Canton, Ohio. Um, obviously, there's been so much awesome stuff for students to take away today, little tidbits to apply their own lives. But if there's one thing you want everybody in here to remember, that one idea they can take away from today, take it home, Take it back to the classroom. What is that one piece of advice you want them to take away? Guys, I'm, I'm, I'm very serious about this because I practice it every day. Tolerance. You got to be tolerant of the person. You don't know what's on that person that's sitting next to you, mine or what they have been through that night before or the day before. So be tolerant and accepting of what they are saying and what they're doing. Don't prejudge or try to make them do something. Just, just be tolerant with the world. You know, a lot of things is happening every day. And a lot of our youth is leaving us fast. And I want you to, you know, I turned 70 on February the 7th. And you know what the biggest blessing for me? To walk over to my mom and dad and kiss them. And my mama asked me, what did I want for my birthday? I said, mother, what I want, you can't afford it. <laughs> but what you've given me is eternal life. You give me everything that I need to make it in life. So I want y'all to do the same thing. And thank y'all for having me. All right. With that, we're going to wrap up this installment. Again, uh, Robert, thank you so much for everything you've done for the game of football. Truly wouldn't be the way it is today without your impact. Thank you for everything you've done for us here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and thank you for being a part of the program today. Thank you. Jay, I want to say thank you to all, all of y'all. If y'all need, y'all can Facebook me at Robert Brazil. <laughs> There's three of us. I'm the what? Junior, not the third, not the senior, because my dad still thinks he's cool to be on Facebook at 90. <laughs> thank you, everybody, so much.